Section 46 of Women of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Women of History by Anonymous. Dorothy Osborne, 1620, Macaulay. One who, for constancy in love against temptations to change, deserves commemoration. Dorothy Osborne was twenty-one. She is said to have been handsome, and there remains abundant proof that she possessed an ample share of the dexterity, the vivacity, and the tenderness of her sex. Sir William Temple soon became, in the phrase of that time, her servant, and she returned his regard but difficulties as great as ever expanded a novel to the fifth volume opposed their wishes. When the courtship commenced, the father of the hero was sitting in the long parliament, the father of the heroine was commanding in Guernsey for King Charles. Even when the war ended and Sir Peter Osborne returned to his seat at Chickson's, the prospects of the lovers were scarcely less gloomy. Sir John Temple had a more advantageous alliance in view for his son. Dorothy Osborne was in the meantime besieged by as many suitors as were drawn to Belmont by the fame of Portia. The most distinguished on the list was Henry Cromwell. Destitute of the capacity, the energy, the magnanimity of his illustrious father, destitute also of the meek and placid virtues of his elder brother, this young man was perhaps a more formidable rival than either of them would have been mrs hutchinson speaking the sentiments of the grave and aged calls him an insolent fool and a debauched ungodly cavalier these expressions probably mean that he was one who among young and dissipated people would pass for a fine gentleman Dorothy was fond of dogs of larger and more formidable breed than those which lie on modern hearth-rugs, and Henry Cromwell promised that the highest functionaries in Dublin should be set to work to procure for her a fine Irish greyhound. She seems to have felt his attentions as very flattering, though his father was then only Lord General, and not yet Protector. Love, however, triumphed over ambition and the young lady appears never to have regretted her decision, though in a letter written just at the time when all England was ringing with the news of the violent dissolution of the long Parliament, she could not refrain from reminding Temple, with pardonable vanity, how great she might have been if she had been so wise as to have taken hold of the offer of Henry Cromwell. Near seven years did this arduous wooing continue. Temple appears to have kept up a very active correspondence with his mistress. We would willingly learn more of the loves of these two. In the seventeenth century, to be sure, Louis the Fourteenth was a much more important person than Temple's sweetheart. But death and time equalize all things. Neither the great king nor the beauty of Bedfordshire, neither the gorgeous paradise of Marley, nor Mrs. Osborne's favorite walk in the common that lay hard by the house where a great many young wenches used to keep sheep and cows and sit in the shade singing of ballads, is anything to us. Louis and Dorothy are alike dust. A cotton mill stands on the ruins of Marley, and the Osbornes have ceased to dwell under the ancient roof of Chickson's. When at last the constancy of the lovers triumphed over all the obstacles which kinsmen and rivals could oppose to their union, a yet more serious calamity befell them. Poor Mrs. Osborne fell ill of the smallpox, and though she escaped with life, lost all her beauty. To this most severe trial, the affection and honor of the lovers of that age was not unfrequently subjected. Our readers will probably remember what Mrs. Hutchinson tells us of herself. The lofty, Cornelia-like spirit of the aged matron seems to melt into a long-forgotten softness when she relates how her beloved colonel married her as soon as she was able to quit the chamber when the priest and all that saw her were affrighted to look on her. But God, she adds, with a not ungraceful vanity, recompensed his justice and constancy by restoring her as well as before. 
temple showed on this occasion the same justice and constancy which did so much honor to colonel hutchinson the date of the marriage is not exactly known but mr courtenay supposes it to have taken place about the year sixteen fifty four from this time we lose dorothy and are reduced to form our opinion of the terms on which she and her husband were from very slight indications which may easily mislead us End of Dorothy Osborne Recording by Pamela Krantz